in Christ and you're a wee little thing, your purpose is to produce fruit. If you're here and you're a woman, if you're a man, if you're in middle age, if you're in older age, your purpose is to produce fruit. And here is the glory that I cannot even comprehend. Did you see what the latter part of verse 8 said, the middle part and the latter? So by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. God is glorified when we use our fruit bearing to bring glory to Him. And the Lord goes on to say that the world will know that we're Christ's disciples. That's important, folks. Now, let's get into the power. It's great to know that you're supposed to produce fruit. And by the way, I feel like I'm being silly here, but, but what does it mean to produce fruit? I don't think that's a silly question because in my Christian walk, I have not always understood what that meant. Now, we know Galatians chapter 5. What does the Apostle Paul say in verse 22 and 23? We have the fruit of the Spirit. That is the work that is done in us when we trust Christ and we're given the Holy Spirit. We're given certain traits that, 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 that really demonstrate the life of Christ. You look at the fruit of the Spirit and every single one of them Christ is a picture of. We're to manifest those in our lives as we bear fruit. Now let me see if I can say them. And I may mix them up because sometimes I mix things up. Here it goes. I am going to be a, a year older pretty soon. But do you remember the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Your version will switch some of those words up, but that's the gist of what they are. So we understand that the fruit that we're to bear, of course, is the fruit of the Spirit. But how do we manifest the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, in our everyday lives? That is what the passage is talking about here. If our purpose is to bear fruit, we're about to look at the power behind that. What does it mean to bear fruit? Well, folks, if you know anything about gardening, and the Lord's going to use the imagery here of a grapevine, that, that there's a vine and there's branches on it, and on the branches there's fruit. That is the purpose of the grapevine, to produce fruit. And, and so when we talk about producing much fruit, we're to be doing the things that the Lord would have us to do that minister to the lost, that minister to our brothers and sisters, that minister in our families, that ministers in our churches. We're to be doing the things that the Word of God admonishes us to do so that people will love Jesus a little bit more each day. That's, in my simple words, what it means to bear much fruit. Are we doing that? Now, no one in here can do that in their own power. No one. None of us in here can live the Christian life in our own power. It's impossible. Oh, we can follow rules and regulations, and some of us are strong-willed. Amen? Do you know somebody in your life that's strong-willed? And we can set in our mind that I'm going to do it. Nobody's going to tell me I'm not going to do it, and I'm going to do it. And you can have a strong will, and you can say, I'm going to go after the Christian life, and, and I don't need a relationship with Christ. I can go to church like I'm supposed to do. I can put money in the offering plate like I'm supposed to do. I can memorize Scripture like they want me to do, but I'm going to leave Christ out of the equation. No, you can't do that. That's not Christianity. That's religion. None of us can live the Christian life without Christ. Because the Christian life is a supernatural life. And, and, and we become part of the family when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. We become part of the, 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 the body of Christ. And if we're going to produce fruit, it's going to take more than strong will. Yes, a strong will has its place. When the devil comes against us, it's good to, to stand firm and it's good to do all of those things that i talked about read scripture serve in the church but you know what if we're going to live the christian life we got to know where our power comes from where does it come from all right that's the next question do you see the answer there it's in verse one and it's in the first part of verse five let's read verse one i am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Look at the first part of verse 5. Verse 5a, if you will, because we're going to break it up into four parts. I am the vine. He says it there again. Verse 1, I am the true vine. 
Now, Israel in the Old Testament was known as the vine. You can go back to the Old Testament, Psalms 80. The psalmist talks about Israel being the vine. Isaiah chapter 5, the first few verses, talk about Israel being the vine. Ezekiel and Jeremiah both mention Israel being the vine. God had uprooted them from Egypt. He had carried them all the way through the wilderness and had planted them in the promised land. He had promised them, if you worship me, if you follow me, I'm going to bless you. None of your enemies will be able to come, and ultimately you will be a blessing to the world. But what did Israel prove? At times they proved to be unfaithful. As a matter of fact, I believe it's Psalms 80 that refers to them as producing wild grapes. Not only were they unfaithful, through a lot of the time Israel was unfruitful. And so Jesus is coming here, and he, he understands as he's talking to the Jews here, I understand Israel is the vine, but Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the one that is going to give the power source to produce the fruit that I'm calling you to produce. Folks, that's what we need to keep in mind today. The Christian life can be lived, and it can be lived well, and you can bear much fruit if we realize that Jesus Christ is the power source. Isn't that interesting here that my father is the vine dresser? What does the vine dresser do? Well, he takes care of the vine. In particular, the part that produces the fruit, the branches. So let's talk about the branches for a moment. All right, if my purpose is to bear much fruit and my power is the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ, then what on earth are we as Christians? Well, we're going to see it right here. Look at the second part of verse 5. Verse 5b, if you would. All right, I am the vine. That's the first phrase. Here it is. You are the branches. We are branches. What is the purpose of the branch? The purpose of the branch is to produce the fruit. We are to be plugged into the vine. Now, maybe we need a modern, modern illustration. One of these days, I'm going to ask the Lord, why did I have to be so hot-natured? Cold-natured preachers would make it a lot better, wouldn't they? Think about your cell phone. I got so outdone with my cell phone the other day. It keeps its charge all through the day. Now, granted, I'm not on it 24-7, but, but it'll make it all the way through the day. And at night, I put it on my nightstand, and I plug it in to be charged. Well, let's just say a, a typical day of usage, if it starts at 100%, I mean, it, it may be on 75% that night. Well, I plug it in to charge, and I just take for granted that it's charged. So the next day, I use it again, and it dropped down another percentage. The third day, I used it again, and it went dead. And I thought, my dear, something's went wrong with my phone. It, it, it's, it's dead. I charge it every night, and, and, and it doesn't drop more than 25% each day. What's going on here? And I realized that my charging cable wasn't working correctly. So the phone that I use to do all the things that I do on, talk to many of you, um, Bible app is on there, several different things I use it for, send text. It, it, it lost its power source. It was plugged in, but it wasn't getting the energy that it needed. And by the third day, it died. And I know some of you use it a lot more, and it wouldn't make it halfway through the day. That's how we are, folks, without Christ. If we're not plugged into the power source, he's the true vine. You're not going to be able to produce the fruit that he wants you to produce. And guess what? We're going to stand before him one day. We're going to give an account of how we produce the fruit. And guess what? We are blessed when we produce the fruit and does what he wants us to do. Can you imagine that? When we do what the Bible tells us to do, we're happier. Let's continue. So the last question, how can I be productive? There's benefits to it. And there's burdens when we don't. Look at verse 4. Here's the answer to it. How can I be productive? 
Well, we're productive by abiding in Christ. What on earth does it mean to abide? It just means to stay put with, to stay connected to, to stay close to. We see that in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. If we're not connected to the vine, we're not going to get the power that we need to tell the lost how to be saved. If we're not connected to the vine, when we get a bad report from the doctor or, or, or when some crisis comes up in life, we're not going to be able to handle it. But if we're plugged into the vine, guess what, my dear friends? The branches don't live for themselves. They don't. They have no power within their ability. Their only purpose in life is to produce fruit. The branch doesn't tell the vine what to do. The vine, let this sink in. Really think about what the Lord is saying here. The vine gets all of the nourishment from its roots. All of the power that the branches need to produce the most wonderful, luscious, delicious fruit is derived from the power coming up from the vine. My dear friend, everything that we need to live the Christian life and to bring glory to God and to show the world that we're His disciples, we get from Christ. Think about what you're going through in life. Some of you are going through some hard knocks right now. Some of you are living with the scars of yesterday. Some of you are terrified about what's coming tomorrow. If you are a branch plugged into Christ, His life, you're not living your life, His life is going to give you every ounce of energy that you need to produce fruit. So let's look at the benefits right quick. We'll see some in verse... Verse, verse everywhere. Let me see where I'm going. There's one in verse 5. There's one in verse 2 and verse 3. There's one in verse 7. There's three benefits to being connected to the vine, and every single one of them are just absolutely amazing. Now, don't look at the first part of verse 2. That's going to give some of us a heart attack in a moment. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Uh-oh. We're going to deal with that in just a moment. I want you to look at the latter part of verse 2 here, the last sentence. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, if you are, are, are looking at your outline, I skipped one and I just realized that. We'll come back to it. It doesn't matter. Let's talk with the pruning right now. So the latter part here, this is a benefit of being connected as a branch to the vine. We are pruned. What is the purpose of pruning? Well, pruning has some negative aspects and, 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 and sometimes some positive aspects, but really they're all positive. But if the, if the vine, if the plant was able to respond with words... It may not understand the pruning process. But, but think about a, a vine being pruned. I have roses, knockout roses in my yard. Anybody got any knockout roses? Aren't they beautiful? If you know what somebody said, no, I've killed mine. If you know just an ounce about roses, you can grow a knockout rose. Here's one of the things you got to know about a knockout rose. If you don't cut the dead blooms off of it, it will stop blooming. If you can keep those dead blooms cropped off of it, it literally will bloom until frost. And, and, and so occasionally I go out and look at it, and it's on a side of the house that I don't go to a lot. And the other day I was around there, and it was all these heads where the blooms had fallen off, and they needed to be deadheaded to be cut off. And so I went through there, and I very carefully, you got to do it carefully because new buds were there too, and you don't want to injure them, but I began to cut all of the dead ones off. What was I doing? I was cleaning it so it'll be more productive. The Lord does that for us. He sees things in our lives that are not good. Sometimes it's our own hard-headedness. Sometimes it's just the Lord putting a little pressure because he wants to get us where we need to be. Do you realize that every calamity that happens in our lives is not necessarily meant for evil it's not the devil coming against us 
It's the Lord moving us where we need to be so that we can be more fruitful. The pruning process, of course, as verse 3 talks about, is the Word of God often. We go to the Word of God and, oh, don't you love Matthew 28? The resurrection of Christ? Don't you love the last few verses where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations? baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Amen and amen. Don't you love that? We read that and we're convicted. Oh my goodness, I'm not making disciples. That's the Word of God pruning part of us that's not fruitful. Sometimes it's just hard knocks because God has to get our attention. And I'm not saying that every calamity comes is, is because of this, because the devil comes after us. But keep in mind, as it was with Job, the devil can't touch you if the Lord don't allow it. See, the devil came after Job, but, but God put some stipulations on it, didn't he? Job may have lost his fortune and his family and his health, and his wife even said, curse God and die. But yet, Satan couldn't take Job's life because God didn't allow that. So some of the calamities that come upon us ought to force us to look up to God. And I know there, there's some things that can happen that just pull the rug out from under us. All right, we got to move on here. So the pruning takes away that that is not productive. But you know what? I do something else to my roses that you don't do this time of year. Some people do it in the fall. I like to wait till there's been several hard frosts. So usually for us, when is that? February. I go out... And I cut the fire out of those things. They'll grow up about this tall in the course of a year. I take them down to about half of that. As a matter of fact, there won't be any green left on them. It's just, it's just stobs with thorns. If anybody didn't understand roses, they'd come by and say, my word, that crazy preacher's killed those things. But I'm going to tell you what happens. I prune them down to nothing. I give them a little fertilizer in the spring when the first leaves start coming on. And I promise you by May, you have never seen something so beautiful. Come by my house and look at them. It is a ball of green. And there may be as many as 100 roses on that thing. Now, if that rose could talk in February, it's one thing to cut off the bad pieces. But to chop it all the way down almost to the ground... That rose would probably say, you're killing me. You've made me ugly. I'm the laughing stock of every rose bush in Grace Magnolia's neighborhood. Why are you doing this to me? Because I know to cut it back, it's going to flourish. My dear friend, sometimes the Lord lets people be taken from us. The Lord allows such storms to come into our life that it brings us to our knees. And we feel ugly. We feel rejected. We feel like that, that life will never go on. And God is saying, I'm pruning you. I'm pruning you. I promise you, you're connected to the vine, the power source. Let me live through you. Spring will come and you will bloom again. Isn't that something? That's one of the benefits. When we're plugged into the vine, and let me tell you this. I read this this week, and I thought I've never thought of it. Do you remember in verse 1, who's the true vine? Who's the vine dresser? It's God doing the pruning. And I'm going to tell you what, we are never so close to him as when he has his pruning shears, and he's down in the thick of it, cutting out what don't need to be there lovingly, knowing that it's going to benefit us, even if it hurts us. So that's a benefit. Now, I skipped one. Let me go back and get the one that I skipped. The obvious benefit is we're going to bear fruit. Look at the middle part of verse 5. All right, the first part, I am the vine. Second part, you are the branches. Here it is. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. All right, that's obvious. What's the other benefit here? I bet you never would have put this together, but the Lord did it for us. Look at verse 7. Do you realize the benefit of abiding in Christ is that God will answer your prayers? Are you serious, Brother Robert? You're telling me that if I'm plugged into the true vine, Jesus Christ, and I'm a branch that is bearing fruit, God's going to answer my prayers? That's exactly what I'm saying. The Word of God says it. 
But I'm going to tell you what, there's some stipulations to it. The verse I'm about to read is not a blank check. We can't just go to the Lord like he's Santa Claus and throw it all out there and say, now I give it to me. God loves us too much for that. I don't owe Lillian any money for this because it's nothing embarrassing. Go ahead and give her $20. She loves chocolate. How many times have I shared that with you? Still to this day, as an almost 11-year-old, she would eat chocolate for breakfast. And sometimes when mama's not in town and daddy don't feel like coping, yes, I'm the pushover parent. Eat the brownie. I don't have time to scramble eggs anyway. But as a general rule, that's an exception, not the rule. I know my daughter does not need chocolate for breakfast. It's not good for her. God knows what is good for us and what is not. He would not be a loving God if he granted every whim that we brought to him. Look at verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Do you know what this verse is talking about? If you want to get what you want from God, then want what he wants. That is the ticket to having your prayers answered. When we pray for selfish things, when we pray for things that will hurt our relationship with Christ, that will damage our witness, God loves us too much to give us that. Like a loving parent would discipline and not give their child everything they ask for. God is even more loving. So here's how it works. When you're connected to the vine and you're bearing fruit as a branch, whose life is living through you? Christ. You don't have your own power. You're connected to the vine. So you are going to be so in tune to what God's word wants because the vine is giving you the power that you're not going to ask for things that are out of his will. So when you pray according to the word of God, you can take it to the bank. God is going to answer it. I've said enough about that. Put God to the test. He won't fail you. You want to see somebody saved? Start praying according to the word of God. You want to see your life transformed? Start praying according to the word of God. And yes, there may be some comforts in there that you need, but start praying, wanting to use it so you can bear more fruit for Christ. God will answer it. All right, let's look at the burdens real quick. There are some burdens to not abiding in Christ. So what is our purpose? To bear fruit. Where's our power? The true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is my position? I'm a branch. How am I to be productive? Well, here's what will happen when we're not. We're going to do it all together. Look at 5, verse 5, the last phrase that we haven't looked at. Here we go. I'll read it all. I'm the vine. That's the first part. You are the branches. That's the second part. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. That's the third part. Here it is, the fourth part. For without me, you can do nothing. Hmm. You can do nothing. I'm kind of reminded of the Revelation. You remember Revelation chapter 2 when, when, when John is writing about the, the churches? Do you remember the Lord is speaking to the church at Ephesus? And he praises them, doesn't he? He says, man, you have worked hard. You've worked hard. And he goes on to say, when an apostle came and proclaimed that he was a believer in me, you questioned them, and you researched it, and you made sure they were genuine in the faith. And the Lord is pleased with that, but you know he has something really big to say. He's pleased with the fact that they worked and did not get weary I mean, they did the right things. They served in their church. They, they, they were doing every, everything looked beautiful. You would look at that church and say, man, Ephesus has got together. They probably formed a pastor search committee and tried to steal the pastor out and take him somewhere else. Men would come in to see how the programs were ran. Do you know what the Lord said about the church? Anybody remember? You have left your first love. And he tells them, you better repent and get it right, or I'm going to remove your lampstand. Why are you sharing that, Brother Robert? 
Well, we're about to get into that. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. I'm going to tell you what, if we lose our motive for doing what we do, if we come to church just to get to appease somebody, or if we read our Bible just because we're guilted into it, or if we do anything that we do for any other reason, I, I don't have time to get into all of this. But, and, and I have nothing in mind when I say this. Well, let me start with myself, and then I can criticize whoever I want to, right? If I'm pastoring this church to get pats on the back, or if I'm pastoring this church to be able to pay my bills, or if I'm pastoring this church so some bigger church will notice me, then I have no right to pastor this church. I pastor this church because Jesus Christ has called me here, and He is my power source, and I am a branch, and I'm going to stay plugged into Him. If you're a deacon in this church and you're doing it just because of the honor of it, or you're doing it just because someone twisted your arm and gave you the most votes, that is not the right motive. If you're teaching Sunday school so that you can be puffed up and everyone be amazed at your intellect, that is not the right reason for doing it. If you're sitting on the pew today... For any other reason other than to worship God and to be fed from His Word and to learn how you can bear more fruit, we need to repent of it, don't we? You heard it, God. It's all to Him. I'm going to conclude with this. Look at verse 2 and look at verse 6. That's the burdens of not bearing fruit. And my dear friend, it's serious. If you see your outline here, you see there's a loss of productivity, there's a loss of fellowship, there's a loss of vitality, there's a loss of reward. All of that's benefits of not being plugged into the vine. Now look at the verses. Every branch in me, verse 2, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, I have nearby dri driven myself crazy researching this this week. Some interpret the phrase here, the Greek phrase that is interpreted takes away, which literally would mean sever, right? You've cut it off and it's gone. Some translate that as meaning lifts up. So the Lord actually takes the vines that are not getting enough sun and they're plugged into the, the, to the vine. He takes the branches and lifts them up so they can be more productive. There's nothing wrong with that view, but we don't know for certain if that's what's meant because it actually is translated here, takes away. Now look at verse 6. Let's pair it with verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Is anyone troubled by that? Now, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to hit it like a, like a fire hydrant here spewing out. It can't be talking about salvation. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We, we're not going to perish if we have everlasting life. You can't have it and have it taken away. Don't you love John chapter 10? Where is it? Verse 27 and following. The, the Lord says, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will not perish. And he goes on to say that no one can pluck them out of my hand, and my Father is greater than me, and no one can pluck them out of his hand. So if you're a genuine believer, we can't be talking about branches here that displease God, and he jerks us out, and we're thrown into hell if we're genuine believers. So it's not talking about salvation here. There's two views of what it is talking about. Three, actually, if you take what I just said, but that one is ridiculous. You, you can't interpret any scripture in and of itself apart from what other scripture says. So it cannot be talking about salvation here. So what is it talking about? Well, some scholars say it's talking about pretenders. You know, not everyone in the church is saved. Some have religion. Some have a strong will to do what needs to be done. And so in, in, in the fullness of time, even though a, a pretender, a person that's pretending to be saved and is not, it may appear that they're producing fruit, God sees straight through it. And in the fullness of time, it will be made known. Well, there's another view, and it's kind of the one I lean toward. Although you're free to interpret it the way the Lord lays on your heart. 
I think it's talking about a loss of reward here. I mean, that's just what I lean toward. Again, if you read several commentaries, they're going to give you every view. And, and you can interpret multiple different ways. But whenever you come to a scripture that has multiple interpretations, stick to what you know. We know you can't lose your salvation. So if it's talking about rewards here, basically, if we are a branch and we're truly planted into the vine, which if you've trusted Christ, you are, and you're not productive, there's chastisement. Read the New Testament church. It happened in Acts. I mean, men and women that dropped dead for, for causing mischief in the church. God was serious about sin. And I wonder if Judas was on their mind right here. If you want to take the interpretation that, that he was a pretender. I mean, he looked like he had it all in order. And he didn't. He was a pretender. So if it's talking about loss of rewards here, of course, at the judgment seat of Christ, salvation's not an issue, but we are going to give an account of how much fruit that we bore. So if you look at it from that point of view, if we're not producing the fruit that we need to be producing as Christians, we're going to wither, and just as a vine will be destroyed, we may not be taken out physically, but our reward is going to be destroyed, and our witness is going to be destroyed. David's an example of that. He loved the Lord, but his whole fiasco with Bathsheba really threw a kink. God forgave it. God still used him, but he reaped it in his family to his dying day and beyond. Look at how it played out in his family. Sin is a serious thing to God. I know we got to say amen now, and there's so many more things I want to say, but here it is, and we're going to have an invitation. Your purpose is to bear fruit. What is that fruit? To do things that bring honor to God. To do things that show the world that Jesus Christ is love and that he has changed your life and saved you. He's our power. And as a branch, when we're plugged into him, we're going to have the power that we need to bear the fruit that we need to bear. And guess what? He's going to prune us so that we'll be the most productive. That pruning may be a gentle procedure such as when we read the word of god and we're convicted and we make the change in our heart or he may really just prune us through something that happens in life but we're planted in the vine so we're not going to wither ever how you interpret verse 2 and verse 6 the important thing is if you've trusted christ be fruitful for no other reason that the lord died for us so that we could be fruitful. Let's don't let him down. Amen? Amen. Did it make sense? Probably too, too oversimplistic, huh? I'm sorry, I'm from Mississippi. We're simplistic people. All you watching from Mississippi, I won't be able to go home again. I'm going to lead in a word of prayer. And I know there's some decisions here tonight. This, this morning, some I already know about. Some of you I don't know about, but I promise you God knows about it. And I'm about to give the invitation. And some of you are going to come forward. You've already talked to me about it. Some of you, God is dealing with you right now. And I don't know, you may just need to come to the altar. You may just need to come and talk with me. You may just need to set up a time to come and talk with me. That's okay. But don't miss out on the blessing of being a fruit producer. It's what God wants for you. And I'm going to tell you, when we do it, our lives are where they need to be. There's happiness that comes from being in the center of God's will. I'm going to have a word of prayer. As I pray, you pray, and then we're going to open the floor up for you to come forward. Brother Glenn, if y'all will come, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, your greatness, Lord. If we had to bear fruit apart from you, it would be terrifying. Truth is, Lord, it would be impossible. I pray right now, Lord, for each individual that's here. Lord, for the one that needs to make a profession of faith. For those that are already coming forward to, to present decisions that you've already made in their hearts. Lord, just give us the grace to be in the center of your will. Let us be a church that produces fruit. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen.